welcome back to my channel and if you're new here then hi my name's Zoe I post true crime videos and I try to post at least one video a week I also have a second vlogging sort of family channel that I have just made for people that is interested in that I will leave a link in the description box please be sure to hit that subscribe button and also turn on that bell so you're notified every single time that I post. I also have a Patreon at the moment so I will leave that linked in the box below as well if you are interested in that. So before going on any further into this video I want to apologise if you hear any background noise. There always seems to be something going on every time that I want to film and I just can't help it sometimes. So I was going to film this case as part of my Where Are You series but I've decided against it. Once I get into this case you will realise why I'm not putting this disappearance in that series. But if you are interested in that series I will leave that linked down below. So I just want to give my usual disclaimer. I mean absolutely no disrespect to anybody that I talk about in this case. Anybody involved in the case or anybody who knows the people involved. I'm simply putting the information together to create a video online and I got all my information online from public sources. Also if I do pronounce anything wrong please politely let me know in the comments. Today we are talking about the disappearance of Susan Powell. Susan Powell was born on the 16th of October in 1981 to her parents Judy and Chuck Cox and they lived in Oregon in the USA. When Susan got older, all her family moved to pull up in Washington. She was described as being beautiful, supportive towards her siblings and larger than life. She was a very positive person and in high school she wanted to be a beautician and she worked really, really hard to get where she wanted to be. She always wanted a family and she was always actively looking for the one or the right person. And then she met Josh Powell in 2000. They had met at a dinner party and soon after they started a relationship together. And then in April 2001, they got married. Joshua Powell was born on the 20th of January in 1976 to his parents, Stephen and Teriaka Powell. And he also lived in Pullup, Washington. His parents' marriage was very unstable and the main factor for this was that his father, Stephen, had a strange obsession with religion. In 1992, Tariqa filed for divorce. And during this divorce it was revealed that Stephen showed Josh some very questionable photography and he also refused to enforce limits on certain behaviours. During his teenage years Josh started to show some very strange behaviour. He started to kill small animals and he also threatened his own mum with a knife on one occasion. At this time he also wasn't in a great mental state, he had tried to commit suicide. In 1998 Josh was studying at the University of Washington and living in Seattle. It was here that he met his first girlfriend Catherine Everett. Josh was very possessive and controlling towards Catherine and he made the relationship very toxic. He restricted what she did, where she would go and who she would hang around with. Catherine had visited and stayed with a friend in Utah and she made the decision just to never go home and call the whole thing off with Josh. After getting married, Susan and Josh had two children together. They had a son called Charles who was born in 2005 and another son called Braden who was born in 2007. Shortly after the wedding, Susan and Josh had moved in with Josh's father, Stephen, in Sad Hill, Washington. During this time, Stephen, Susan's father-in-law, started to gain a weird obsession with Susan. He would spy on her, he would follow her around with a camera and film her, he even stole her underwear. And it was later revealed that he created weird love songs about Susan. In 2003, Stephen decided to confess his feelings to Susan. Now, Susan was obviously shocked and intimidated by 
his approach. The whole conversation was caught on Stephen's camera's audio. Soon after, Susan and John moved out of state and Susan was relieved to be out of Stephen's house. There did seem to be some marital issues going on between Susan and Josh. Josh had decided to keep in contact with his father Stephen despite what had happened between him and Susan. Josh also refused to attend church with his family and this caused tension between the two. And all this was later revealed in journal entries and emails by Susan. Susan's friends had also picked on on Josh's possessive behaviour and him being controlling towards Susan. In 2007, Josh filed for bankruptcy and later on in 2008, Susan filmed a very chilling video of all her home and all the possessions in it. She stated which possessions were hers and which possessions were Josh's. Uh, this is me, July 29th, 2008. It is 12.33. Mountain time, um, covering all my bases, making sure that if something happens to me or my family or all of us that our assets are documented. This is me, hi, sorry, and it is, can you see that, 11.44 a.m. And I am documenting all our assets just in case of any emergencies, fire, flood, damage, disputes. And we have two Samsung monitors. This is Josh's computer, and there's some type of backup device and speakers. And here's the kind of pimping out stuff he's done to his computer. He built it himself. I think there's like five hard drives, something about doing raids. There's those for all the computer geeks. Hover Storm, you bought a stupid hovercraft remote control toy. Uh, keys and locks, cooking, cleaning supplies, there's another remote by the Clorox on the right. And I had necklaces too, I don't know where those are, but I got in a rage, as you can see, and broke this. There's duds and pearls and opals in there. Broke this and threw all my DVDs and made a mess. Because he was angry at me was about a year or two back. Now it was assumed that she filmed this in case of a flood, but something more sinister was in the end of the video. She actually said that if she was to be found dead, even if it looked like an accident, it isn't. On the 6th of December 2009, Susan and her two children attend church. Nothing is amiss on that day and everything is pretty normal. After church, they walked home with a friend called Custer Helliwell. And that afternoon, a neighbour came over to the Powell home and they had pancakes for dinner and the neighbour stayed around for a chat. At around 5pm, Susan took the opportunity to go for a nap. So her neighbour had gone home and Josh decided to take the two children sledging. At around 8.30pm, Josh is seen pulling back into his driveway. The next morning at 9am, the children's daycare starts to become worried when the children don't arrive. They repeatedly called Susan and Josh's mobile, but after they didn't get an answer, they then decided to call Tarika, Josh's mother, and just let them know that they didn't arrive to the daycare. After trying to get in touch with them themselves and also going around to the house, Unfortunately, Tarika decided to call the police and report the whole family missing. When police received the report, they started to get really worried that something more sinister had happened to the family. So they decided to force entry into the home as they thought the family may have succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning. But when they got into the home, nothing was found. There was no trace of the family. And weirdly, there was two dryers drying a couch that had looked like it had just been washed. The next day on the 7th of December, Susan didn't show up to work. Also, her purse, her bag and keys were all still at home. And these are usual possessions that someone needs in day to day. Later that day around 5pm, Josh returned home with his two children. Now obviously police were stunned to find out where he had been so they immediately took him to the police station for questioning. 
Josh claimed that he left his home around midnight to take his children camping in Simpson Springs, Utah, and he left Susan sleeping at home. When police tried to trace a campsite, there was no evidence of there being a campsite where Josh had described. Also, police were a bit stunned at the fact that he had gone camping at midnight knowing that he had work the next morning. He didn't ring his employer to inform him that he would be going camping with his children or that he wouldn't be in. Josh's reason for this was that he thought it was Sunday instead of Monday, which again is really weird. Police began an investigation in hopes of finding Susan and on the 9th of December police searched Susan and Josh's home and this is where they found traces of Susan's blood. They also found a letter written by Susan expressing the fear for her life and also a life insurance policy on Susan that was worth more than 1.5 million dollars. DNA was conducted on the blood and one match was found to be Susan's and the other was from an unknown male. In January 2010, just a month after his wife's disappearance, Josh decided to up and move him and his two children to his hometown in Utah. This really didn't sit well with the public. People couldn't understand why he wouldn't want to stay at home. For all he knew, Susan could come home, she could be found in the area and, and they just couldn't understand why he wouldn't want to be there for that. They had moved in with Josh's father, Stephen. Now, a little while after this, Brandon had drew a picture which was a little concerning. The picture was of a truck with three people inside and when he was asked where was his mum, he said she was in the trunk. So police decided to interview Susan and Josh's eldest son, Charles. He did confirm that they had gone camping that night but he said their mother had gone with them but she didn't return with them. And also a couple of weeks after Susan's disappearance, Charles had told his daycare that his mummy was dead. So things had started to become heated between Charles Cox and Stephen Powell. It seems the disappearance had sort of ripped the family apart. They were even filmed having a confrontation at the roadside. Stephen believed that Charles was making lies about Josh and his family. So Josh and his family soon came out to say that Susan was mentally ill and that's why she chose to leave her family. Now I don't understand why they would say this because why would Susan make a video showing all her possessions, showing everything she owned and how she feared for her life if she was planning on just running away and leaving her children anyway. And also I don't think she would just leave her kids with somebody that she clearly was intimidated by. But Josh's story changed again. He decided to say that Susan was in fact cheating on him with a journalist called Stephen Korcher. Now Stephen Korcher had disappeared around the same time as Susan and Josh for some reason believed that they was having an affair and that they both ran off to Brazil together. But there is absolutely no evidence at all that links the two cases. And Josh's father Stephen had started to act really suspicious. He even went on TV and did an interview and said that Susan was the type to come on to him. That she would be coming on to him all the time and acting sexual in front of him. Susan's family were understandably upset by this. They knew straight away that this was lies because Susan had said about how intimidated she was by Stephen. This interview turned all eyes on Stephen and police decided to get a warrant for, to search his home. They found over 4,000 pictures of Susan that he had taken without her knowledge. They also found some other scurry, disgusting things on the other three of his computers which you can probably guess what it is but I'm not going to go into detail. Stephen was charged with owning pornography and also following somebody without their consent and because of these charges Susan's children were taken into foster care. Now Susan's parents did try to get custody of their children and eventually they won that battle. They got temporary custody of Charles and Braden. The judge had told Josh if he wanted access to his children, 
he had to move away from his father. That's exactly what Josh did and he moved to Grand Washington and eventually he was allowed supervised visits in a centre and then after things were going well with that he was allowed supervised visits in his home. But little did the court know that this would be one of the biggest mistakes that they could make in this case. Elizabeth Hall was the caseworker who was conducting these supervised visits and on the 5th of February 2012 she took the children to go and visit their father and everything was normal and everything was fine. To be fair the children seemed like they were really happy to see their dad. When they got out the car they were skipping in front of Elizabeth and went through his dad's door and as Elizabeth got to the door Josh slammed the door shut in Elizabeth's face and didn't allow her in. Now these children were in this man's home, yes he was their father but he was possibly a dangerous person, that's why the supervised visits were there in the first place. So Elizabeth straight away rang 911 to let them know what was going on. Morning. Hey, I'm on a supervised visitation for a court ordered visit and something really weird has happened. The kids went into the house and the parent, the biological parent whose name is Josh Powell will not let me in the door. What should I do? What's the address? It's 8119, and I, I think it's 89th. Um, I, I don't know what the address is. Okay, that's pretty important for me to know. Um, sorry, I can't, just a minute, let me get in my car and see if I can, if I can find it. Nothing like this has ever happened before at um, these visitations, so I'm really um, shocked, and I could hear one of the kids crying. But he still wouldn't let me in. But I think I need help right away. He, he's on a very short lease with CSHS and CPS has been involved. And this is the craziest thing. He looked right at me and closed the door. And I'd like to pull out of the driveway because I smell gasoline and he won't let me in. You want to pull out of the driveway because you smell gasoline but he won't let I you... Smell, he, he won't let me in. He won't let you out of he, the driveway? He won't let me in the house. Whose house is it? He's got the kids in the house and he won't let me in. It's a supervised visit. I understand. <laughs> Whose house is it? Josh Powell. Okay, so you don't live there, right? No, I don't. No, okay. I'm contracted to the state to provide supervised visitation. I see. And how did... And he's the husband of missing Susan Powell. How did... He, how, this is a high-profile case. How did he... How did he gain access to the children before you got he there? Got, they, I was one step in back of them. Okay, so they he went into the, the house and then he face. locked you out? Yes, he, okay. he shut the door right in my face. All right, all right. We'll have somebody look for you there. Okay, how long will it be? I don't know, ma'am. They have to respond to emergency, life-threatening situations first. The first available deputy... Well, this, is, this could be life-threatening. He went to court on Wednesday and he, he didn't get his kids back. And this is really... I'm, a, I'm afraid for their lives. Now I'm quite disgusted with how this operator dealt with this call. He didn't understand the severity of the situation and what Josh could possibly be capable of. He just told Elizabeth that an officer will be with them when they have chance because they're fighting life saving emergencies. But little did the operator know that this was a life saving emergency. Elizabeth even told the operator on the phone that she could smell gasoline but the officer didn't try to get police there any quicker and within a few moments of this call starting the house exploded. Hello? Hi ma'am, were you calling about the fire in the 8200 block? Yes, on he exploded the house. Ma'am, yes, do you know the exact address of the house? Or are yes, you it's, it's 8119 189 Street. Okay. Two hours. okay, stand line. Do you know if anyone's in the house? Yes, there was a man and okay. two children. I just dropped off the children and he wouldn't let me in the door. Okay, stand line for the fire department. Okay, I'm going to get them on the line. Do not hang up. Hold on. Killing Josh and unfortunately killing Charles and Braden. There was no way that anybody, not even an adult, could survive the severity of the explosion. Josh Powell, who lost custody of his two boys after being suspected of killing his missing wife Susan back in 2009, killed himself and the children Sunday by setting the house on fire with a gas explosion. An investigation was conducted into what happened that day and the police did 
say that the explosion was obviously planned. The official cause of death for Josh and the children was carbon monoxide poisoning, but the children did have wounds to their body and it's believed that their father induced these wounds by using a hatchet. They also found two five gallon tubs that had been used for gasoline. They also figured out that gasoline had been poured all the way around the hall. Josh had contacted his friends and family by email and telephone and his message was goodbye. With all this information, police said that this was a murder-suicide. This incident just made people 100% think that Josh harmed Susan or that he was the cause for her disappearance. Also when Josh's father Stephen was notified of the incident he didn't seem to care at all. He didn't care that his son had killed himself or that he had killed his grandchildren. Stephen was released from prison in 2017 and he died a year later in 2018. In August 2012 police released documents about Josh and in these documents it said that Josh didn't seem slightly concerned on his first questioning about his wife's disappearance. It didn't seem like he cared that she was just gone, disappeared into thin air. He also took all the money from Susan's retirement accounts and cancelled all appointments she had for the future. He also asked some of his co-workers how to hide a body. And these are all big red flags and I'm unsure to why nobody thought to just tell the police this information when this was first all happening. So police became suspicious about one of Josh's friends called Michael. He had been named the beneficiary on all the insurances so that meant if anything was to happen to them all, he would get the money. He also got rid of his car soon after Susan's disappearance and when police tracked down his car they used sniffer dogs and the scent of decomposing body was found in the car but when they did further tests the DNA was inconclusive. In 2013 Michael actually committed suicide. Police believed that Josh and Michael were involved in Susan's disappearance together. But unfortunately it seems like we won't know seeing as everybody involved has now gone. Susan's family started a court battle with Josh's family to try and win back over Susan's estate and also get her pronounced presumed dead. Luckily they won the court battle and Susan's parents got all Susan's estate back. In 2017 they also started a court battle with child welfare. They believed that big red flags were missed and if things were done differently the two children would still be alive today and that is something I highly agree with. I don't understand in why in situations like this where caseworkers are supervising a possibly dangerous person why is there only one caseworker? Why isn't there two? Maybe if there was two that day that could have avoided this happening. This court case is currently on hold at the moment but as soon as I do get any information on it I will pin it in the comments down below. So that is all for this case and this case is truly heartbreaking as I feel some of the things that happened really could have been avoided. Them two little boys had their full life ahead of them and it was just taken away from them and I just feel horrible and researching this case it made me feel horrible and it makes me feel even worse not knowing what happened to Susan whether she was harmed or whether she really did try to just run away from Josh I don't know I really don't know but this researching this case really really got to me so that is all for today's video if you did enjoy this case, please give it a big thumbs up. If you have any more suggestions of cases you'd like me to cover, please comment them down below. My list is getting a little bit short at the moment, so it would be great if you could tell me some ones that you want me to cover. Also, don't forget to check out the Patreon, which is linked down below, and my second channel. Go and subscribe over there. And also, if you've not subscribed to this channel yet, please do. I am so trying so hard to hit 1000 subscribers so yeah make sure you hit that subscribe button turn on the bell and i shall see you in my next video bye